Good evening, all. I'd like to call the Tuesday, February 28th, 2023, regular meeting of council to order. And before we get on to adoption of the agenda, I would like to send a shameless plug to my wife on her birthday. Happy birthday, my love. You can slap me when I get home. <laughs> I did not, for health reasons. Uh, and with that, we'll get on to 2.1 adoption of the agenda of this evening's meeting. Councillor Blanchette, seconded by Councillor Pearson. Are there any additions, amendments, deletions? Hearing none, all in favor? It's carried. On to 3.1, an adoption of the minutes of the February 14th, 2023, regular meeting of council be adopted. Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Mullock. Are there any errors or omissions arising? I would like to add, uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Pearson, for chairing that meeting. I really appreciate it. Hearing none, all in favor? It's carried. 4.1, we do have a delegation this evening from BC Assessment, uh, providing a 2023 assessment role review and highlights presented by Ms. Erin Smith. Welcome. The floor is yours. Uh, typically a delegation is uh, about 15 minutes, but if we're getting close to time, uh, we'll just take a pause. We'll have a quick vote. If the council issues, we'll extend. Sounds good. There's a bit of preamble in the beginning that I can kind of go through quickly. Awesome, thanks. <laughs> uh, we can just, does this turn the TV on? I'm not sure. So I, just behind yourself, Dean, if you don't mind, there's a, a remote there. If we just get you <laughs> power from the television, that'd be much appreciated. There it goes. Yeah. Yeah. And if we did this correctly, it should just pop right up. Windows is updating. Perfect. Okay. Incredible. Okay, so yeah, I'm Erin Smith. I'm a Deputy Assessor with BC Assessment. Thanks for having us here. Um, so I'll go through an overview of BC Assessment, what we do, and then also the 2023 assessment role, um, and then some particulars for the Village of Belmont. Okay, so topics, basically what I just mentioned, we're going to go through about us, how we do evaluation, um, classification exemptions, assessment key cycle, assessment cycle and key dates, uh, the relationship between what we do and what you do as a, as a municipality, and then we'll go over the role over year for 2023. Uh, if you have questions while I'm speaking, please feel free to interrupt me at any time. It's totally fine to, to ask me while I'm doing it. So BC Assessment, we've been around since 1974, and we were commissioned basically out of a nonpartisan commission that was given the undertaking of deciding what would be the best way to go forward with assessment in British Columbia. Um, the assessment valuation that we use is known to be the VARA system uh, internationally because we do use a classification-based system with variable tax rates. Our service commitment um, to both the public and to municipalities is to be open and transparent, to be fair and accurate, to be timely and accessible, to be knowledgeable and respectful, and to be innovative and collaborate with all of our property assessment partners. Our commitment to British Columbia, it, our vision is to be a dynamic and reliable assessment service provider um, that supports strong and vibrant communities in BC. Our mission is to create uniform assessments and be a trusted property information company. We most recently just did a value refresh, so we do have four new values. Um, so we are here for each other. Um, I have to actually look at these because we just did this. <laughs> we own our experience. We are one team and we are committed to, we are dedicated learners. We're committed to always learning new things. Our commitment to British Columbia, we have lots of different customers. Um, we do have customers that are property owners um, and we are dedicated to all of our property owners. There's residential, non-residential, both market and non-market properties. We're committed to you, local governments and other indigenous nations and other taxing authorities. And we do have commitment to the provincial government. We fall under the Ministry of Finance. So our main product 
the assessment role. I'm sure you're well aware what the assessment role is, but essentially this is an assessment of all real property in British Columbia. Uh, there's a little over, I think, 2.14 where we're at, 2.14 million properties in BC, and we assess all of them. Um, the assessment rule basically contains uh, information around ownership, uh, classification, exemption for each property. Um, we value different properties differently. So the majority of properties are valued on market value, which our valuation date is July 1st. Um, why market value? Market value is the most reliable um, and fair way to value properties because this makes similar valued properties pay similar amounts of tax. Uh, what this to means to you as a local government is that there will be fluctuations in the market because <laughs> markets go up, markets go down, and because we follow that fair market value, we also go up and down. And so that's probably a key takeaway for you is the markets do change year over year. And we do consider each assessment cycle a brand new thing. Um, big picture is we do try and keep taxes distributed fairly, which is why we do every year reassess everything. Uh, factors affecting market value. So there's all sorts of things and location, location, location. It's true that is a thing for real estate and that has a big impact on the market value of a property. But other factors, um, land use controls, and this is where local government does come into play quite a bit. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, yeah, our land characteristics, this is everything from topography to um, if there's riparian rights, all sorts of different characteristics for land. When we get to improved properties, we do look at the characteristics of the improvements such as age, um, condition, size, et cetera, all the things you would expect to value a property. And then we do have income producing properties. So a lot of commercial properties we do value on income. So we take into account rental rates, expense rates, vacancy rates, capitalization rates. One of the fundamentals of market value is highest and best use. And this is really where working together helps us come to the best valuation for a property. Um, so in order to be at a highest and best use, the property needs to be valued in whatever is physically possible. So dependent on size, topography, what can you physically build on that property? Legally permissible, this is where you come in um, when we're looking at OCP, zoning, any other restrictive covenants, anything like that, that does impact the value of a property. Uh, financially feasible. So essentially, if you're a developer and you're going to develop a property, you're not going to build something that's not going to make any money. So it does need to be improvements that would cause you to have a rate of return on the property. And then maximally productive. Um, as a developer, again, you're going to build the thing that is going to make you the most. So we consider the highest and best use. However, a property would be improved that would have the best return for the property. And so this is one of the things that um, Land use. This is where we, this collaboration between local governments and ourselves uh, really comes into play because anytime anything is done for zoning, OCP changes, things like that, that does impact how the property could be used and that does impact the highest and best use. So that's where working together is, is really important for us to be aware of any changes that are going on. Um, other things that come through. <clears throat> um, there's all sorts of different things affecting market value. Um, if you're having uh, a boundary extension, that can impact it. Um, I believe you guys have done that pretty recently. <laughs> um, so anything like that can definitely impact the value of a property. Um, any changes to uh, the population when there's turnover, if different neighborhoods are suddenly under redevelopment for new uses, that obviously can impact the property as well. So how we classify properties, there are nine different property classes. Number one is residential, roughly 70, 75% of most properties in the province fall into that classification. Uh, class two is utilities, so this is what we consider long and skinny things such as hydro lines, telephone lines, phone lines, et cetera. Class three is supportive housing. Um, this is housing that is deemed to be um, necessary for the good of the public and in order to be in this classification, it must be granted through an order in council. Class four is major industry, so mills, mines, et cetera. Uh, anything that is a prescribed capacity would fall into class four. Class five is light industry, which is more like manufacturing, producing a product, not such big scale as, as uh, the major industry. 
So class six is a funny one. That's our business and other. And I always like to say the and other. So this is a catch-all class. The definition of class six is anything that isn't in a different class. So everything, all sorts of things, parts of churches, parts of halls, retail, banks, all sorts of things are in class six. So that it's important to remember the business and other because there's lots of stuff in class six. Class seven is managed forest. This is anything that is under a timber management plan. Um, important to know about that one. It is a market rate for the land, but every second year it will fluctuate because the timber value gets added every second year. And then class eight, again, this is a little bit of a misnomer on this one, recreational and nonprofit. Does not mean everything that's a nonprofit gets class eight. Uh, it's mostly recreational for land only, such as parks, playing fields, et cetera. The nonprofit actually refers to places of public worship or fraternal nonprofit organizations. So not just any nonprofit. And then class nine is farmland, which is a regulated legislated rates. <coughs> By having different classifications, we're allowed, we're able to enact the variable tax rate, which is where you are able to set your different tax rates for the different classes so that you can shift the tax burden throughout the different property classes as you see fit. And exemptions. So this is something you're probably also familiar with. So properties have many different types of exemptions that exempt them um, from paying all or a portion of tax assessed by a municipality. Uh, the common exemptions are permissive, which would be something granted by a taxing jurisdiction, or statutory, which is something granted under legislation. In a municipality, it's likely granted under the community charter, though there are some things that fall into other, such as the School Act, Local Government Act, et cetera. So our assessment cycle, um, key dates, January 1st to 31st. This is our, what we call inquiry period. This is when the notices go out and we have all the property owners calling us, asking questions, which is what we like. We always advise if you have a question, please do call us. Um, and the date to appeal to the first level of review is January 31st. I'll talk about appeals a little bit later. February 1st to March 31st, we consider, that, consider this our revised rule time. We are sitting through PERP panels, the Property Assessment Review Panel, and um, getting, to get, getting ready to put out the revised rule. April 1st to September 30th, this is sort of our production time. If we have any assessment projects we need to complete, inspection of new construction, all the things that we need to get the data ready to set the next rule is done during this time. And I would just note the second level of appeal, the date deadline is April 30th. And then October, 30, October 1st to December 31st, this is our key role setting time. This is when we're setting the models, we're setting what we call MACMs, which are mass appraisal <coughs> compute, uh, market modifiers, which are what we use to determine the assessment rates based on the sales that we see all year. So lots of work going in this time. Um, October 31st is the deadline, one physical condition and permitted use of a property, but also the deadline for us to receive um, or for you to pass permissive exemption bylaws. So that's a key date for you, October 31st. Those have to be passed by that date. November 30th is the last day that we can reflect LTSA changes in our role um, because we, there's a bit of a delay between the feed from, from LTSA and when we get that. So November 30th, ownership changes up till then will be reflected on the role. Everything else we have to put through a review period. And then December 31st is the ownership on title. That's who's liable for taxation. So the relationship between assessment, what we do, and taxation, the portion that you do. Um, so we create the assessed value. We are independent of taxing jurisdictions. Um, our assessed value comes out January 1st. And then the property tax rates, that's where you come in and you set your property tax rates based, rates based on your budgetary requirements. And then those two things multiplied together come to the property taxes payable, which are typically due first business day in July, unless you're on an alternate set schedule. So impact of changes in assessed value. Now this is something we get a lot of calls about, hearing, oh my assessment went up 30%, I can't afford for my taxes to go up 30%. So we've been really trying really hard to educate the public and that's not necessarily how it's going to go. Uh, this actually is a screenshot from something that is on an assessment notice. <laughs> um, so essentially it's more important what the average of that property class did and how your property moved in relation to the average. So if your property class went up less than the 
average, your taxes are likely to decrease. If your property, property tax assessment went up the same as the average, your property taxes will likely stay the same. If your property went up more than the average, your property taxes are likely to increase. All of those scenarios assume no change in the tax rates. If the tax rates change, of course, there's probably gonna be a little fluctuation in everybody's, but it, so it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one ratio. My assessment went up, my taxes are gonna go up. And so that's just really important for property owners to understand, because that's a huge concern usually. <clears throat> So 2023, this is the province as a whole. We assessed 2.16 million properties this year for a little over $2.72 trillion. This was up about 12% from 2022. Um, Non-market change, which is typically new construction, was down 1% from 2022, but still added 13.52 billion to the roll. Property class one, the residential, was approximately 77% of the entire roll for the province. So for Valmont specifically, so your role, there was 869 properties, which is two more than in 2022. Um, and your total value of your role was 327.5 million, which was about a 24.8% increase from 2022. And I would note that that increase, I think it was about 2.3% was from non-market change, so new construction. The rest of that, the majority of that was from market movement, from the market moving up. Your new construction was up quite a bit, 78.5% over 2022. Um, so a lot more new construction happening here last year, I would assume. <laughs> and then your residential class one was about 70% of your role, which is pretty much in line with most municipalities. We'll just take a quick pause. Sure, right yeah. Uh, what's council's wish? Looking for an extension moved by Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor McLean. Any questions on the motion? All in favor? carried thank you for your patience uh, so your completed role for Valmont for 2023 residential single-family the average increase was 25 to 30 percent and again this is based on sales in the market in 2022 centering around the July 1st date commercial industrial saw a 0 to 16 percent depending on the type of property so the appeal process, uh, in January, the properties, property owners have an option to call in and ask us questions, and if they disagree with our assessment, they are welcome to appeal to the property assessment review panel. This is the first level of appeal. Um, the review panel, as well as the subsequent property assessment appeal board, are completely independent of us. They are designated by the ministry, um, and we have no uh, affiliation with them. So from March 1st to, or sorry, February 1st to March 15th, we sit in review panel. Um, typically these hearings rough, last about 30 to 45 minutes for the appellants to prevent, present their evidence. We present our evidence and the panels make a decision based on what they've seen at that hearing. Depending on the outcome of that appeal um, of the review, they, they then have the option to appeal to the Property Assessment Appeal Board if they're unhappy with the pro Property Assessment Review Panel. Uh, I would also note that we also have the option to, to go to the Appeal Board. So if a decision happens through PARP that BC Assessment doesn't feel as equitable and doesn't feel as correct, we can appeal a property to PAB as well, which we don't do it that often, but every once in a while there's a decision that we just feel is just not equitable for everybody and we do take it to PAB. Yeah, uh, and so PAB, the deadline to appeal to PAB is April 30th, and then that process does not have a designated timeline. It's always our intention to have it done before the next roll. It doesn't always happen, it really depends. Sometimes there's coordinated property groups that are hundreds of properties across the province. It takes a little longer usually. So that process is a lot more time. There's no time limit for that board. They can request quite a few different documents. We have quite a few meetings, so it actually is a much lengthier process. Uh, completed role acceptance. So typically um, we see between 97 and 98 percent acceptance of the role. Um, so you can see the province line is the lighter green and Valmont is the darker. So not necessarily following the same trend line but still within the same sort of <laughs> percentage brackets that we expect. <laughs> yeah. And then change completed role to revised role. So this is essentially how does the role change from when we do the role January 1st to after the PARP session, the first re review period. period. Um, and again, here you can see 
Vermont doesn't necessarily follow the same trend line as the province, but again, sort of sticks within the same percent change overall. <laughs> you definitely are. And we do find that. I guess I would say I've been an appraiser in northern BC. I was born and raised in Prince George, so always in northern BC, and we don't really follow what happens in the rest of the province yeah. <laughs> across the board for northern BC. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And so collaborating with us. So basically by sharing with us, sharing information and working together, it's a really good opportunity for us to make sure that we're really on top of what's happening in all the communities, especially when it comes to any sort of changes to the zoning, to the OCP. If you're seeing anything in your community that, that you think would help us have a better indication of how the market's going, definitely share that. Um, there's a number of things that we send out requests for, such as your bylaws um, for permissive exemptions, revitalization exemptions. We typically send out reminders in the summertime for all of those things, but definitely you're always welcome to give us a call if you have a question about something or send us information you think we should have because it really helps us out because we do, we do value a lot of properties, so it's really helpful when you send us the information and we're not out there looking for it. Um, there is uh, information sharing. I believe you're probably already set up on Citrix ShareFile to share all those types of things with us. Um, digital documents is kind of the preferred method these days, electronic documents. Um, some building plans, all that sort of thing coming in through digitally really helps us to collect things. Yeah. We do send data collectors out throughout the year to actually physically go take pictures and measurements, but having a building plan definitely saves us a lot of steps. Sharing of permits is also very important. That's the trigger that allows us to know there's changes on a property. Uh, additional resources. So if you ever have questions from constituents who are wondering about things, the first line of would be our website. We have a lot of information on our website. You can look up a property. You can look at the neighboring properties. You can look at sales. There is a lot of information on our website. And it's, it's where we send people first and say, go take a look at this. And then if you still have questions, come back to us. Um, property information trends. There's an interactive map. We have information about the appeal process. So a lot of information on our website. Um, so I would really say if you have anybody asking questions about assessments to direct them there and then on the website there's obviously information on how to contact us if they still have questions. And then additional resources. Uh, the gov.bc site does have information about both levels of appeal, both the appeal board and the review panel, uh, homeowners grant, and also property tax deferral programs. There's lots of information on there for them as well. Any questions? <laughs> Hopefully I got through that as quickly as I... <laughs> a motion to receive. Council Blanchett, second by Council McLean. Questions for the delegation. Thank you, Ms. Smith, on behalf of Council. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, first and foremost, I'll uh, throw it to my colleagues. <laughs> well, I can get started this parade off. Sure. Um, can you describe any revenue streams that supports the uh, BC assessment body, or is the BCA a basic expense line item under the Ministry of Finance? So we are actually self-funded through property taxes. We are a line item on property assessment notices, or on the tax notices that go in, so that is where we're, so we are a Crown Corporation, but we're sort of self-funded. <laughs> Yeah, we're, through, we're through taxation. Through taxation, yes, yes. Okay. But we do not get, the ministry does not collect from like income taxes or anything and then pay us. It does come through property taxes. We're a line item in the property tax notice. Well, you'll always be flush, I'm guessing. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> it takes a lot of people to get it out there. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, one question. Who saw the appear on the uh, appeal panel? Who are the people? Um, so uh, on the appeal panel, it depends on which panel. So for the assessment review panel, that is the first level appeal. Those are typically constituents in a bunch of different neighborhood, bunch of different locations that are uh, they are delegated by the ministry, um, not our ministry. They are under. I want to say Ministry of Housing, but I think they might have changed. We're Ministry of Finance, so we're not actually under the same ministry. Um, so they are designated, and then they usually I think I have a two-year contract, and they're just peers they're just people from the community they do not have to have any specific property information they do not have to have any specific qualifications um, they're just designated and they sit and they listen to the evidence so that at first level appeal is much more of a review of your peers um, the property assessment appeal board that is based out of richmond although they do have members all across the province they tend to be property 
actual like realtors, lawyers, people who actually have information on property tax and law. So that level of appeal is a lot more sophisticated than the first level. And I would say even PAB, so if there's a PAB decision, um, those can be appealed to the BC Supreme Court, the BC Court of Appeals on a point of law. So if there is a ruling that somebody disagrees with, they can potentially go to a further court. Typically it's though it's did the board err in law on their decision as such, because it's not actually about the valuation, the exemption, et cetera. It's on a point of law. So we do have cases that sometimes go right to court of appeals. And then we, sometimes it's in our favor and we're, we just keep doing our thing. Sometimes it's not, and we have to potentially change something we're doing or go down the path of enabling a legislation change. Cause usually it's kind of problematic wording in the legislation. <laughs> yeah. So. Follow-up, Councillor? Next in line. Uh, on, on the appeal above the appealant, uh, has there been examples of uh, an appeal put forward by the BCA that is actually in favour of the appealant? Um. Are you generally winning most of those? Uh, no, I would say at the first level of appeal, the review panel, we lose most of us, um, <laughs> so which is why we end up taking some of them to the second level of appeal in times. Um, no, so I guess I could mention that when somebody calls us in in January, if they have an issue or a problem with their property and we take a look and we're like, you're right, there is an error, we can correct that and do something we call a bypass so we don't have to go to panel and we'll make that correction within the revised rule on our own. Uh, so that would sort of be the situation where we're agreeing with the information they're providing to us. Um, typically, by the time we get to the second level of appeal at the PAB board, um, there's a much larger issue and we're not typically in agreement with them. Um, in some instances, it does mean getting lawyers involved in actual hearings and it can get fairly complicated. <laughs> yeah. So typically PAB is ap appeals that are done by agents, not property owners themselves. So property tax agents. <laughs> um, oh, and just one final comment for those out there. Uh, I totally agree with the, uh, please check the BC assessment website. Um, registration is totally free. Login is quite easy and it gives you uh, access to a whole bunch of historical uh, realms, uh, not only on your property, but neighboring property. So uh, kudos to BC assessment. Thank you, M M Smith. Yep. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, so when somebody does make that call, do you um, ever come down and do a visual on the property or is it usually something that can be dealt with over the phone? Uh, typically we try and deal with it over the phone because we get a lot of calls and having to send people out in the field is, is a little more time consuming. But we definitely do go do inspections if it's something that requires that. Uh, lots of times those do fall to the second level of appeal simply because of time constraints. PARP absolutely has to be done. The last day we're allowed to have hearings is March 15th. Um, so time constraints for that first review. Um, we typically will not do inspections during that period of time. It's also January, it's also February to March 15th, so it's not ideal for traveling to inspect the things. Uh, but yes, we definitely do go out and, and reviews. We'll even also, if a property owner calls in and says there's you know certain damage or something, we'll ask them to send us photos. Like we, we'll, we will take that self-reporting information as well. Yeah. If there's no other questions or comments, thank you, Ms. Smith, for yeah. taking the time to visit us uh, and giving an overview of BC assessment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, any comments, discussion on the delegation? All in favor of receipt? It's carried. And Ms. Smith, please do not feel obligated to sit through a council meeting. Uh, as, 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 as much as I uh, uh, appeal uh, to uh, how exciting this can be, uh, we're now moving into a reading file. So, Thank you. Is there, uh, under section seven, is there any uh, thing in the reading file that council would like to surface? Councillor Pearson. Uh, yeah, a couple things I'd like to look at. Uh, first, number one, the uh, from municipal <laughs> affairs, yeah. the growing community fund. Um, really looking forward to hearing what the results of that will be towards Vailmount and 
community allocation in general. Yeah, so uh, exciting to see. And also number two, uh, disappointing that we did not, uh, were not successful in getting the internship for the, I have to read it off here, Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions. Uh, hopefully the work continues in the area uh, with the study, but without the use of an intern here. Well, I can, I can assure you that the, the work of uh, Dr. Shea and his team will continue, um, but I'm, I'm with you. Uh, that it will be, uh, we won't be housing a, uh, or having a, a uh, exter uh, external workforce join us. Mm -hmm. That's it for me, thanks. Thank you. Others? If there's nothing else, moving on to administrative reports, section 10, 8.1, the wind ring proposal. Uh, there's a couple of recommendations that council can consider this evening and uh, the first one would be prior to council deciding whether or not to move forward, uh, the proponent be asked uh, to provide further information on the proposal including detailed costs or regulatory requirements or that council just receive and file the report. Council Blanchett. I would move recommendation one. That prior to council deciding that staff reach out to the proponent. Second by Councillor Pearson. Discussion, Councillor Pearson. Along with that, um, I would like to see a delegation by the proponent versus a paper um, file um, to be have the opportunity to ask questions. Um, in in looking at this proposal, I mean it's a very exciting idea, but again, nothing is done for nothing. So what the final costs are for the proposed second and third units uh, has me a little worried. Uh, amendment moved by Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Blanchett. Uh, discussion on the amendment? All in favour on the amendment? Discussion on the original motion? Uh, the, the amendment is carried. Uh, on, on the original motion, uh, further discussion? Thank you by, for the amendment, by the way. <laughs> All in favor? It's carried. I covered off the discussion part. So. You sure did. <laughs> it's a long motion. Uh, 8.2, uh, Smart Renewables and electrification, uh, electrification Pathways Program for Indigenous Engagement Grants application. Recommendation here, the council directs staff to apply for the Smart Renewables and Electrification Pathways Program Indigenous Engagement Grants for up to $150,000 over three years to support consultation activities between the Village of Bailmount and Simp First Nation. Moved by Councillor Blanchett, second by Councillor Mulek. Mulek, sorry. Um, discussion. Let's go a long ways in supporting. It's a, yeah. All in favor? It's carried. 8.3, we do have a proposed section 57 notice on title to consider at 1144 Sixth Avenue. And with a recommendation that council directs the corporate officer as authorized by section 57 of the community charter to place a notice on title for the property located at 1150, 1144 6th Avenue legally described as DL7355 Plan 9689, Lot 13, PID 0127916 regarding the installation of a wood burning appliance with an accessory building and occupying a structure without an occupancy permit Contrary to both the BC Building Code and Village Bylaws, what's Council's wish? Moved by Councillor Pearson, second by Councillor Blanchett. Discussion, Councillor Pearson. Uh, yes, a couple questions on this. Uh, one, I'm wondering if the uh, accessory building is still being occupied without an occupation permit uh, through you to staff. I'd refer to our, our building inspectors. You may have more accurate information at this time, but um, my impression is that the, as far as we are aware, that it is being occupied. Um, any, anything different to that effect at this time? Uh, no, I was actually contacted by the, the current tenant today, so that would indicate that it is being occupied still. And just note for those watching at home, uh, there was a response by the uh, building services 
that uh, there was in contact with the tenant uh, recently, uh, therefore the building is occupied. Uh, uh, Follow-up? Yeah, follow-up to that. Um, this is not a new issue. This has been ongoing for a period of time. Uh, I'd like to know what further action is op, uh, available versus um, just putting a title on the property as far as the decease and desist order to have that um, dwelling vacated since it is not permitted for occupation at this point. Um, as we continue to let things go the easy way, it just will continue to go. Um, so I'm just curious what other actions are available. Uh, staff would certainly be able to come back with a, a full list of what m levers may be available to encourage compliance in this matter. Uh, one element would certainly be continued pursuit of the bylaw infractions and the fines around that. I, I do understand that there is one fine that uh, is with collections at this time. Um, in addition to that, there may be some other levers that certainly could be pursued. Uh, I'm happy to report back to Council on what those may be. Councilor Blanchett. Um, this has been going on since August 2021. I'm wondering why the RCMP have not been involved and why this person is still living in this place. This is, like why? Like just putting something on there, like they haven't even paid their fine. <clears throat> we need to do something immediate, I think. <clears throat> and I think calling the RCMP and saying this is what's going on. This is. This is also a danger to whoever's living in that place. We don't know anything about how it was built or anything. I mean, so this is wrong on so many levels. Have the RCMP been called since um, August 2021 ever? Mr. Depineau? To the best of my knowledge, the RCMP are not involved in, in this matter. Um, other seeking if there's other information available just due to the timeline of the incident. Any any other comment on the staff team around potential RCMP involvement? Seeing seeing none, I, I believe that is the case, Councillor, that uh, this matter hasn't been referred to law enforcement in that, uh, in that sense and that the bylaw and building pieces have been the chosen method for attempting to reach compliance at this time. Um, the notice on title option serves to give protection um, to future purchasers potentially of the property so they are aware of the infractions. While the other issues are attempted to be addressed, as you'll see in the report, there's um, comment around both the structure itself, uh, its use at this time and occupation, as well as the wood, uh, wood burning appliance. So able to move out those pieces um, uh, through those other means so far. I would um, add an amendment that we contact the RCMP immediately and find out what we can do to vacate this person out of that um, building. Moved by Councillor Blanchette, seconded by Councillor Pearson. Uh, discussion on the amendment. Councillor Pearson. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure RCMP are the first step, but I mean, definitely something proactive in this. In this, um, Unfortunately, they're making more rent than we're charging in fines, so um, we're not winning uh, at this point. So again, it's another, another case of putting the cart before the horse and, you know, begging forgiveness after the fact. And uh, we're seeing it way too often on too many files that, you know, build it and then ask permission to build it. So um, so I agree we need to move forward. I'm just not sure RCMP are the resource to be the next step, but we need to be proactive. I would uh, comment that I think we can, uh, through a note, with, with a notice on title, it is a immediate next step. Um, the uh, the fact that we are receiving communication from the tenant uh, allows us the opportunity to further engage with the property owner. And I think nobody wins if we just go down there with a bulldozer and get out. It's winter. 
Um, but I do agree with you around compliance under the building code. We really have zero idea of, of the work that has been done. Uh, it's never been reviewed or stamped by building services. So yeah, further discussion around the amendment? Could we ask the RCMP to accompany our building's super bylaw officer to go and have a discussion? If, if the tenant is reaching out to you, then maybe there can be a discussion there and maybe this person doesn't get evicted today in the snow bank, but there's some conversation with the RCMP present. Through the merit of the councillor, I suppose the question that uh, comes to my mind would just be about the about the parties involved. So, the, so at the moment, we, uh, as I gather, have con significant concern with the the property owner um, who's engaged in these activities and so far hasn't reached compliance despite the attempts. I, I don't know that the same um, same feeling is applied to the tenant in this case, who who would be the one suffering uh, potentially from you know an eviction of some sort. Um, the, the second piece would be around jurisdiction, and I'm, I'm not sure if the RCMP would be the ones to settle the, the tenancy dispute. Um, I, I'm unclear on the piece. I, I appreciate that the safety element there um, around the provincial legislation for the building code is, is the piece that is, um, I think, most concerning around um, the safety of the facility is what I'm hearing. So I, I would certainly uh, be able to follow up with the RCMP to determine if it's themselves or somebody through another one of the agencies who deal with building who ought to be there to affect the greatest change. Um, but at this time, I, I'm not sure if it's the RCMP specifically that would be most appropriate to attend um, or if it would have the effect on the owner who is off, uh, off site from the village versus the, the tenant, if that makes sense. So the owner of the house is not living in the house? He has a tenant in the house and in the um, accessory building? From the correspondence we have at this time and, and to the staff team present, do please correct my, my comment if I'm mistaken, but the secondary dwelling or the secondary structure um, is, as we understand it, uh, best of our knowledge, occupied where the concern exists. We understand that the principal owner's um, address is updated to be in the lower mainland, um, southern part of the province, and that they've been out and away from Valmont for uh, some period of time. Um, our first contact with the owner in, in some time uh, happened just yesterday at about 11 a.m., which you'll note from your council package is uh, about 50 minutes before the new deadline. Um, we understand from their comments that they are interested in trying to reach compliance. Uh, we made a commitment to the homeowner that we would pass that on to council, that they had reached out and suggested they would like to reach compliance. Um, but they have suggested that they are not aware of any of the correspondence from here unto now. Um, our assessment and per the recommendation is that that may not be the case. Um, we, we think that there's sufficient communication that has taken place to suggest that this notice on title is a reasonable next step. Um, as well as whatever council might wish to do from here forward around uh, additional measures. So to, to summarize mm -hmm. that, yeah. I, I'm unclear on the um, residency of the primary home. The secondary structure we understand to be occupied. The home we understand not to be occupied at this time by the owner. The owner is not in Valmont to the best of our knowledge. Follow up, Councillor? I'm just trying to think. Just this kind of thing annoys me because there's rules and the people aren't following the rules and this is a safety issue you know and and you know the clean air task force has built a you know you can't have a wood burning appliance in an accessory building and and they've gone and done that and they've put a person it could be a family for all we know with kids in there and we don't know the safety of the structure so you know and it's very great that this guy's living in Vancouver far away from this you know, and he, all of a sudden, the last 10 minutes, he says, okay, okay, I'll help you. And he hasn't paid this fine that, like you said, is, you know, probably nothing. Um, and this has been going on for so long, and it's, it's just, it's really frustrating, you know. Perhaps we can get back to the original motion. Yes, sorry. We'll vote on the amendment to connect with the RCMP. 
uh, to get an understanding of where jurisdictions lie. Mm -hmm. You're okay with that? Yeah, I, 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 I was under the understanding that the owner was living in the home. So to you know, send the muscle, as it were, mm -hmm. um, would sort of defeat the purpose. But I just think that we need to do what we can so that this doesn't happen again, like Councillor Pearson says, because we are finding a lot of these things are coming up and they shouldn't be. So well, we have we to be a bit more. To our, our yeah, well, we just need to be a little more, you know, noticing what's going on a bit more. On the amendment, yeah. all in favor? No. It's Sorry carried. that I yackered on. Back to the original motion discussion. Do you have a follow up on that? I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Then on the uh, original motion, a section 57, notice on title at 1144 6th Avenue, all in favor? It's carried. Well, moving on to happier times, 8.4. Uh, we have a municipal donation request for a 100th, thank you, Mr. Schneider, for a 100th birthday celebration for our very own Alice Olson. And we're looking to for council to approve a grant to Sherry Tinsley in the amount of $318.15 to cover the cost of the community hall rental for a 100th birthday celebration for Alice Olson. Moved by Councillor Pearson, second by Councillor Mullock. Discussion. Councillor Pearson. Just quick clarification. Um, just in the wording, just so everybody is aware out there. Um, so in the approval of a grant in the amount of um, there is no physical cash transaction. It's strictly a line item to pay for the rentals. Debit has to meet the credit in order to have the bottom line. Perfect. Thank you. No, because we can't waive no, fees anymore. But for people to understand, <laughs> that's we are waiving fees without waiving fees. <laughs> and uh, council will also note uh, the invitation. So please reach out to. Um, Do we have Ms. A time? Because we have a date, but no time. Does anybody know? I, I'm sure that it'll be a follow-up okay. uh, through either social media presence or when you do talk to Ms. Tinsley about, oh, I'd like to join you. Staff can also follow up on the time, Councillor. Be happy to get that information. Perfect, thank you. Further discussion? All in favor? Congratulations to Alice. That's marvelous. Yeah, it is. It's carried. 8.5, uh, considering a temporary use permit 2302 at 1292 Fowler Place uh, with a recommendation that TUP 2302 for 1292 Fowler Place legally described as Lot 21, District Lot 7355, Caribou District Plan EPP 66975 proposing a TUP for a period of two years be given initial approval. Moved by Councillor Blanchett, seconded by Councillor Mullock. Discussion. Well, this has been working very well. I think so. Further discussion? All in favor? It's carried. 8.6, we have a report to be received for the Columbia Basin Trust Ready Grants Program Public Input Process for 2023. Moved by Councillor Pearson, second by Councillor Blanchett. Discussion on receipt. Everyone's ready for March 5th. Got your electronic votes in. <laughs> Ready for public input. Awesome. All in favor of receipt. It's carried. And finally, under uh, 9.1, road closure bylaw number 872-2023. Uh, we're looking that road closure bylaw number 872-2023 be adopted as presented. Moved by Councillor Blanchett, second by Councillor McLean. Discussion on adop final adoption. All in favor? It's carried. Uh, there was no new business as far as I know. Does anybody have a notice of motion to bring forward? Then I'll move to Council Reports 12.1. We'll go to this side of the room, Councillor Mullock. Already on February 21st, I attended a uh, Tourism Belmont meeting on f 
February 23rd, a CBT adjudication committee, uh, and we started a re uh, reviewing the uh, proposals. And that was, we're really looking forward to uh, next weekend, mm -hmm. next Sunday. How many do you have? Eight. Thank you, Councilor Mullick, uh, Councilor Jack. So on the 23rd, I was a judge for the elementary school science fair, and it was fantastic. It was so much fun. It was so interesting seeing what ideas the kids had come up with. I mean, it was just, you know, and, and the smarts that went into the thought, and it was just incredible. It was really hard to, to mark everything, too, because you're like, <laughs> And it was very successful. All the kids uh, had a good time. The school, you walk down the, um, the hallway like this and you're looking at everything and all the kids are hyper and full of sugar. And it was just, it was a really good experience. Um, and congratulations to all of them because it was really well done and uh, a lot of fun. I'd like to, even if I just go next year, not even as a judge, just to see all of the, what the kids were doing and stuff. And they all had a good time. They all really enjoyed it. And it was throughout the school. So no matter where you went, there was, there was something to see and a volcano here and lemons hanging there. And, and it was great. So that was on the 23rd. And on the same on the 23rd, we had a wayfinding meeting mm -hmm. and we're looking at where we're gonna be placing the signage um, throughout town. So that was it. Sorry, who had a wayfinding meeting? Um, the, I don't know what we're sort of called. What are we called? Kind of the sign, sign committee, I guess. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. Didn't there's. Know we had one. Well, there's myself, <laughs> Councillor Pearson, our CAO, and our uh, EDO. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure of the uh, official title, but uh, I understand that there's been a bit of a working group around mm -hmm. the project for, for some time. So. Fair enough. Yeah. So that was the the four of us there. Yeah. Not a committee. Yeah, we're just a group. <laughs> a group of crazies. Thank you for doing that. Uh, Councillor McLean. Um, my report is old, as I was away the last meeting, so I'm, I'll report back to Monday, January 30th, when I had a local governments committee negotiations update meeting for round 15 of the Columbia Basin Trust um, treaty negotiations and then a local government committee strategy session after that. That evening from six to eight, we're still talking January 30th, I participated in a webinar with the local government committee public online meeting to share information about the Columbia River Treaty local government's committee's efforts to integrate social and economic objectives into river management scenario modeling for the Columbia River Treaty renewal. Uh, this session focused on interests associated with the Columbia River on February 1st and 2nd, along with the rest of council and staff, I participated in the strategic planning sessions for the village facilitated by Doug Fleming. And on February the 3rd, I sat on the um, Columbia River Treaty negotiations update for CBRAC. Again, about round 15 of negotiations. And that was it. Thank you so much. Uh, that's Round 15, eh? That's, that's, we're, we're to round 15. Mm -hmm. And then the next round is mid-month of March. Well, we are getting pretty close to 2024. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Council Pearson. Okay. Um, in the absence of the mayor, on February 15th and 16th, I attended Regional District, Fraser Fort George. Uh, first, the Committee of the Whole meeting, uh, which was um, budget uh, discussions. Um, I kind of planned for the afternoon, being there was a 320-page agenda, which we covered off in just over an hour, so a little time to kill on that one. <laughs> they, uh, they moved through it pretty quick. Uh, the second day was uh, committee and uh, the regular meetings of the uh, regional district. Uh, also on the February 23rd, I joined Councillor Blanchette for the uh, elementary school science fair. Um, Definitely an eye opener. Uh, luckily, we've done it once and know how to judge for next time because it was a challenge. Uh, there were some really, some really, really great projects. I was happy to see all the projects involved. Coke and Mentos were strictly photographic and not live experiments in the room because I could just picture that going wrong. But um, you know, 
varying degrees of enthusiasm and and just looking at the thought processes, especially when you were looking at the uh, the primary um, projects, it was uh, it was interesting to see how their minds work. So, and then again, also with Councillor Blanchett, the uh, working group. I I guess it'd be basically an RMI um, funding working group. Uh, previously, we we worked on the benches and garbage can. Uh, placements for the Bigfoot Trail, and now we're looking at uh, wayfinding uh, signage to draw people off the highway and guide them into the uh, the core of our beautiful downtown. Um, now I have a couple items to bring up. Uh, motions uh, to do with TransCanada Yellowhead Highway Association. Uh, first, their AGM is coming up May 5th in Edmonton, and... I would be looking for a council support to attend that meeting. It's on a Friday, so travel. By Councilor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Blanchett, uh, that Councillor Pearson, uh, in his role with the uh, TCYHA, uh, attend their AGM. Discussion, all in favor? It's carried. Thank you. And secondly, um, we had a request brought forward by a local business um, and in that it's it's looking at um, traffic patterns on highway 16 through the park and basically asking um, for an upgrade on the west park gate um, having to do with traffic delays and stuff during peak um, things i mean a couple things we talked about in discussing the mo uh, resolution where um, economic impact when you've got trucks sitting for half an hour in line um, waiting for tourist traffic to get their brochures and stuff and what to see in the park mm -hmm. uh, environmental I mean you've got all those vehicles idling for an extended period of time and uh, just traveler safety because as soon as you've been held up for half an hour you're trying to make up that time on the other end so um, so Excuse me, I drafted a quick resolution um, looking for council support and uh, also to forward this on to uh, possibly um, NCLGA for their resolution session. And do I need to read? Uh, no, I can read it for you. Oh, okay. uh, whereas all commercial truck traffic that passes through the east gate of Jasper National Park also passes through the west gate of the park and whereas highway 16 and 5 the yellowhead highway are the primary transportation corridors for commercial tourism and local traffic and the designated oversized route for industrial traffic movements therefore be it resolved that a letter be written to the government of canada parks canada requesting that the west gate of Na jasper national park be upgraded to be consistent with the east gates east gate improvements that have been recently completed and are proving beneficial to all travelers Moved by Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Mullock. Discussion on the proposed resolution. Well, Councillor Blanchett. We just came through there yesterday, and yeah, it would be good to see go, you know, because I do. We have been all in line, and then all of a sudden, phew, everybody's just shooting down the road a mile a minute, right? So yeah. All in favor? It's carried. Thank you. And then one last note, um, I sat today, I did an online training session um, that was put together by the uh, SIMP First Nation. Uh, very good online training session, very informative on uh, just discussing uh, communication and uh, respect for their land. So. No, it's a, it's a great uh, learning tool. Thank you very much. Uh, I too have to go back into January as I was uh, not present for the February 14th um, council meeting. Uh, with that, uh, January 25th had a committee of the whole meeting with the regional district Fraser Fort George budget. So the uh, overall administrative uh, budget, a uh, little more than 380 pages. Uh, 
the next morning I had an opportunity to meet with the regional manager, uh, uh, Derek Baker, and his colleague, uh, Christina Dahl of Pacific Can. Uh, they're formerly known as the Western Diversification Fund. Uh, we had a, a great uh, discussion around uh, different funding models and uh, uh, a quick look at the suite of their programs. Uh, later that day, had a Regional District Phaser Fort George open board meeting. Uh, and then the next day, uh, got right back here for uh, the Columbia Basin Trust board meeting. Uh, Chair Carver has uh, appointed me to their housing committee as chair, uh, director on their investments committee, and director to the Columbia Basin Broadband Corp, and uh, newly uh, to their executive committee. Thank you. And then uh, followed up with the um, conclusion on January 28th of their Columbia Basin Trust Board meeting. January 30th had a core funding discussion with uh, SIMP First Nation, First Nations Major Projects Coalition, and Colliers and Associates uh, around um, percentages and what that core might look like. Uh, first and second was uh, day one and two of our strategic planning session. Thank you so much to uh, both council and senior administration for uh, your valuable input uh, to Mr. Fleming's facilitation. Uh, February 6 and 7, um, under an invite from uh, Chief Lampro, Sim First Nation, as well as uh, various other um, encouragement, uh, Mr. Pryor and I uh, whisked down to Richmond for the old growth strategy recommendations multi-sectoral planning session. Uh, it was two days put on by the province. In this case, about uh, out of the 120 participants in the room, there was a two-thirds uh, non-government uh, organizations, such as uh, some ENGOs. Uh, there was uh, some industry in the room, and unfortunately, there was only uh, myself. Uh, Mayor Runtz from McBride and Councillor Frankel from Vanderhoof, uh, who were local government representatives. Uh, our First Nations partners were not uh, invited to this session, and so uh, George thought it would be a good idea that ourselves, McBride, Carrier Lumber, um, SIM, Vilma Community Forest um, attend. Oh, uh, and Gilbert Smith, pardon me, um, out of Barrier, because they're one of our major trading partners, uh, attend and to at least get a, a, an understanding of what the province might be, might be heading towards. And, and with that, I would be looking to, uh, for Council's financial support uh, for just my per diem. Uh, Velma Community Forest is covering all the travel. We'll be billing them as such. Uh, but I would be looking for council support for per diem would be uh, two half days and two full days, so a maximum of three. Moved by Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Blanchette. Uh, discussion? I have more to follow. All in favor? It's carried. Thank you, Council. Um, one of the major key takeaways was this is a top down approach from Victoria, not even through the regional managers. Uh, or uh, regional district managers. This is the premier uh, setting uh, targeted dates of a declaration around old growth management um, in uh, by April and a implementation uh, by October. So very fast, very swift. Um, extremely happy that the uh, group from the North Thompson Robson Valley uh, was able to attend. Um, the, the, it's good timing in, in terms of a more recent announcement on February 15th uh, where uh, the, uh, there is a plan looking to be put into place that includes the formation of a regional forest landscape planning and um, both uh, ourselves from, from a local government, SIMP and industry do support, uh, personally support the actions to protect old growth forests with state uh, that when it comes to decisions involving uh, management within our valleys, it should be left to First Nations in collaboration with local governments. Councillor, uh, sorry, 
Councillor. Chief Lampro really agrees with that statement um, by saying that we have an excellent working relationship with our local government and forest industry partners within the territory and we work very well together and support each other. And so with that, I would be looking for Council's uh, support in uh, joining uh, a, a, not, a, not an official uh, coalition of the North Thompson Robson Valley, but a, a working group as we work towards old growth management uh, and uh, by um, taking part in an open statement to Victoria with SIMP, uh, the Village of McBride, ourselves, uh, looking for both uh, a fine line in uh, well-managed old growth being integral uh, to both the multiple economic sectors, such as not just forestry, but backcountry uh, tourism and recreation, uh, biodiversity, and, and how we will continue to support SIM uh, taking the lead on old growth management within their territory. I would be looking for a resolution to such a fact. Moved by Councillor Blanchett, seconded by Councillor Mullock. Um, discussion. Are always great because yeah. you get everything coming in. Yeah. So it's only going to benefit. It will. Yeah. Uh, I, I guarantee it. And, and to see uh, us just even at the registration table, uh, no badges for us. It was like, who are you? Mm -hmm. What are you doing here? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, you'll let find. You. Find, let me tell you. Uh, and uh, Mayor Runs, I have to say, um, knocked it out of the park, uh, both being a um, registered professional forester and a community driven leader. Uh, he was spot on uh, both days. Councillor Pearson. Is there any further word on when the follow up uh, sessions will be held? The regional uh, forest landscape planning tables uh, sometime in March, uh, maybe in Prince George. There's been no follow up on is there one in Kamloops, is there one in Cranbrook, is there one in Revelstoke, Golden, uh, we're really at the back end of any sort of news release. And will ex invitations be extended to the uh, latecomers to the last? I would hope. <laughs> I would hope uh, that uh, the, uh, our voice was heard. We had truth to power. Um, and in fact, we had folks coming to our table throughout that um, planning session saying, Ooh, yeah, we didn't know that you guys work together so well. Yeah, so I mean, we, we did make a standing offer to the Associate Deputy Minister that if he's ever through this way, bring your hiking boots, uh, we'll go for a walk, you can see how we, we manage. And I think he's gonna take it up, take us up on that offer. Follow up? So, so one other thing, and I, I find it ongoing disappointment in, in our provincial government that um, very little beyond hope exists. Um, the announcement of the new chair of the Forest Practices Board um, only caught my eye because of the title and then when I looked at it the only person that does not live on the island on that board is from Williams Lake. There is absolutely zero northern representation. Um, forest practices are different all over the province and it would be nice to have a little more varied input in that process as well. Well, as is the coastal growth versus the interior old growth. Yeah. So, uh, can we send something down? Pardon? Can we send something to that committee saying, hey, perhaps there needs to be some more slots open? Or well, I think we should look at um, some of their initial findings, and then we can certainly comment as a, as a I hate the, the word coalition, but working group. That's a group. Yeah. There's nothing more on that motion. Um, all in favor? It's carried. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. <laughs> if we could, uh, Your Worship, just clarify the language of that resolution. If, if I understand properly, we have um, a resolution to participate in an unofficial joint coalition around trade and old growth uh, management in the North Thompson uh, with our regional partners as described. And to work with the uh, SIMP nation on uh, communication strategy. Thank you. Is that fine with council? Thank you. Uh, and then uh, just before we caught flight, um, had a discussion with Northern Health Authority on excessive idling, to your point. 
uh, February 15th, uh, again from afar, uh, took in the forestry funding announcement for uh, First Nations and uh, forest landscape planning, which exactly was in line to, you know, I, you go to these meetings and you stomp your feet and you jump up and down, and then the very next day or the very next week they announced something that you were really passionate and fighting about and they could have just took you aside and said, you know, don't say anything, but we got something coming, you know. Um, uh, February 27th, uh, had an initial meeting for the Local Government Leadership Academy elected official seminar, uh, asking uh, myself to sit on a mentorship panel while we're in Prince George. And then February 28th, today, it was budget day here in BC, um, moving from a I hope I got this right. Five point seven billion dollar surplus to a four point five billion deficit. Yeah. Ish. Uh, that is my uh, report. Uh, motion to receive. Moved by Councillor Mullock, second by Councillor Blanchett. Discussion on the. Uh, uh, one more question on. I'll go to you first, and then. Um, what, what was the. Um outcome of the discussion with Northern Health about idling? Because I had a, a run-in with somebody today about it. Uh, th there was a, a, there was an agreement to send a joint uh, letter mm -hmm. um, to our industrial partners here in the Valley okay. and to encourage a top-down uh, communication strategy from their management team to their uh, contractors and, and employees and highlighting the uh, health impacts of excessive idling. Mm -hmm. um, to Councillor McLean, uh, round 15, gone and go uh, gone, looking for mid-month again? Yep, mid-month. For mid -month. round 16? Yep, in March, yep. And do you feel um, that kind of traction will continue throughout the year, or will that be the last kind of Kick, uh, before summer? Well, we are planning on meeting, um, I, I believe in, I can't remember if it's in Cranbrook, but I think it is, that we have a, a scheduled meeting at the beginning of May in person for the first time. In, well, that'll be nice. Yeah, it will be really nice to bring us all together. And there's, there's new people that I haven't met in person yet. But uh, yeah, it's gaining traction, as you say. Well, I mean, uh, Cranbrook Airport's pretty nice to fly into if you don't want to drive for 10 hours. Yeah, I've never flown in there, no. Okay, I uh, have no further discussion. Oh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, all in favor of receipt. It's carried. Just give me a second while my computer recognizes me and we'll get back. Uh, there, we've got time for public comment this evening. Uh, not seeing a whole lot of folks rushing towards the podium. So I'll uh, thank those that may or may not have wanted to have a public comment uh, and thereby would uh, favor a motion to give notice to proceed to an in-camera meeting under 15.1 uh, for one item per section 91K of the community charter to discuss matters related to K negotiations and related discussions respecting the proposed provision of a municipal service that are at their prior preliminary stages and that in the view of the council could reasonably be expected to harm the interest of the municipality if they were held in public. Moved by Councillor Blanchett, seconded by Councillor Mullock. Uh, there should be no discussion, so all in favor. It's carried. That uh, brings our open meeting to a recess. <laughs>